Bueno, buenos días a todos. Eh, en nombre de la Facultad de Ingeniería de la Universidad Nacional de Entre Ríos y del Instituto de Investigación y Desarrollo en Ingeniería y Informática de CONICET, que es una, un instituto de doble dependencia de la universidad y del CONICET, eh, les doy la bienvenida. Lamentablemente nuestro decano está en reunión de consejo directivo y por lo tanto no puede estar presente, pero un poco como comentaba Gastón hace un rato, en mi doble papel de vicedecano de la facultad y de director del instituto, eh, les doy la bienvenida. Eh, según, me comentó, según me comentó Gastón, eh, este workshop es la continuidad de un proyecto STIC AMSUD realizado entre la República de Chile, universidades de la República de Chile, Brasil, Francia y Argentina, en este caso el grupo del Laboratorio de Señales y Dinámicas No Lineales de la Facultad. Este es uno de los grupos más productivos y más, eh, más grandes que tiene el Instituto y también la Facultad, y por lo tanto eh, creemos que va a ser una jornada, un, tres jornadas, mejor dicho, muy fructíferas para eh, discutir eh, los avances que han tenido con este proyecto y las perspectivas futuras que este proyecto puede tener. Así que no quiero sacarles más tiempo, simplemente desearles mucha suerte y espero que todo salga correctamente. La facultad y el instituto están a disposición de la organización de este evento. Así que muchísimas gracias para los que han venido aquí a la, a la facultad y muchísimas gracias al grupo de Gastón que ha organizado eh, este evento. Así que bienvenidos y mucha suerte. Ah, ya me fijo. Ahí. Si hablo acá, ¿me va a escuchar? Eh? Sí. Okay. Hello. Professor Prasanna, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Marcelo, I can hear you. Okay, N now I will say a few words for your introduction yes, and then you can de deliver your talk, okay? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Marcelo. Okay. Uh, For those of you joining us uh, via YouTube, you can ask your questions in the chat and then after the talk we will pass them to the speaker so he can answer them, okay? I don't know if I can start right now. The streaming is okay? Okay, so yeah. uh, thank you for uh, Professor Prasanna for joining us today. Uh, professor Prasanna is currently a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT, Darwad, Karnataka, India. His teaching and research interests include signal processing, machine learning, deep learning, and its application to speech processing. He has supervised 25 PhD theses in this area and published more than 200 research articles. So we're happy to have Professor Prasanna uh, giving the first talk of our event. And I will now uh, give you thank the you. room so you can deliver your talk, Prasanna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Thank you, Professor Rufinar and Professor Gastona for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Marcelo, kindly tell me whether I'm able, you are able to see my slides. Yes, Prasanna, we my can slides? see the presentation perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for the workshop organizers for giving me this opportunity. So in this talk, I will uh, briefly highlight uh, some of the works that we have carried out for last uh, five, six years 
in using excitation source features for pathological speech processing. So that is the um, uh, overall this one. Um, uh, before beginning my talk, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to a premier institute in Asia, uh, which is called All India Institute of Speech and Hearing Mysore. In short, we call it as Aish Mysore, which is one of the well-known speech and hearing institute in the country as well as in the Asia. This work was jointly carried out with that institute. And also, this work was mainly uh, done when I was at previous institute called IIT Gohati, where Professor Rufiner as well as Vignalo visited us in our group for delivering uh, as a part of Indo-Argentina project, as well as uh, uh, the GAN course organization Professor Rupiner visited. Um, and I would like to express sincere thanks to my collaborators, uh, Professor Pushpavati, who is currently director of this institute, Aish Mysore, and Professor Ajishke Abraham, a professor in the Department of Electronics at Aish Mysore, who was very instrumental in chalking out this problem and working together. And I had uh, four research scholars uh, working along these different problems related to pathological speech processing as a part of this team. Now who have earned their PhDs and moved on to their profession, I would like to sincerely thank them because most of the work I'm taking from their PhD thesis or work. One is Dr. Akilesh Kumar Dubey, who is currently faculty at Kale University in India. And Dr. Shishir Kalita, who is in Arms of Tech Air, uh, Chennai, India, which is a company working on speech technology development. And Dr. Pratimo Nomo Sudro, Sudro, who is at University of Sheffield, UK, doing her postdoc. And uh, the last one is Dr. CM Vikram, uh, who is at Samsung, uh, Bangalore, India. So this work, what I'm going to present today is mainly because of the collaborative work that we have done as a team for five, five, six years. Outline of my presentation is as follows. Uh, in the case of um, pathological speech, we have considered a specific condition, pathological condition that is called cleft lip and palate case. I will detail about that because there are many pathological cases possible. We are focused mainly on cleft lip and palate case. One of the major issues we encounter in the cleft lip and palate case is what we call hypernasality in the cleft palate speech. So then uh, one of the focus of our work was how to detect this hypernasality. Of course, there are methods existing in the literature using what we call spectral features, which mostly extract or exploit vocal tract system information. We wanted to see the feasibility of using excitation source information for hypernasality detection. That is one of the contributions that we have made. I am going to explain that. Then, using then we have combined this with the existing methods for hypernasal detection and developed an overall system for assessing the amount of hypernasality. For example, as human subjects ex experts, speech language pathologists, when they listen to the speech signal, they will be able to say whether it is mild hypernasality, moderate hypernasality, or severe hypernasality. Can we develop an automatic method for grading like this? Next thing, one of the another contribution was, if you consider the hypernasal speech, can we enhance the oval regions present in the hypernasal speech? Again, using the excitation source information. That is another contribution. Then the next thing was, 
uh, this what we call VOP in expansion we call it as oval onset point. That is the instant at which the onset of the oval take place. In a normal speech, there are standard methods to detect oval onset points. Once I have oval onset point, I can use it for many acoustic phonetic analysis. But in case of pathological speech, especially CL, CLP speech, because of the hypernasality present, accurately detect, de locating the oval onset point is a challenge. So as a part of this work, we have explored the uh, oval onset point detection methods and uh, refined them to better suit for oval onset point detection in case of CLP speech. Once I have oval onset point detection method, we have used that in detection of what we call misarticulated stops. The stop sounds are important category of sounds. So the uh, how to detect such misarticulated sounds, we have developed a method using VOP detection. And finally, uh, we have developed a combined framework for assessment of misarticulated sound. In all these methods, of course, these are some of the methods picked up from each of the four PhD research scholars working in the group. Uh, I have not covered their complete work. Even in the uh, this presentation also, I may not be able to cover all the methods, but the underlying motivation and the exploration in this work is how do I exploit the excitation source information for different aspects of pathological speech processing by considering CLP speech as a reference. And depending, since I've been allotted 40 minutes time, I will see how much I will be able to cover. Otherwise, we can always discuss at a later point of time. I will share the slides with Marcelo. Of course, some of you are maybe working in CLP speech. If you take CLP, cleft lip and palate, it is a craniofacial abnormality and a congenital disorder. It can be either, uh, no, it's a combined or isolated case or unilateral or bilateral. For example, unilateral means only one nasal tract uh, um, lip is, one side of the lip is uh, uh, not there. And uh, along with that, pellet also may not be there. It, this is shown here, okay? Or both the sides, bilateral complete cleft lip may be there. So, so in that way, unilateral, bilateral, combined or isolated, complete or incomplete, or it may not be seen externally as a deformation like this. However, if you see the pellet, it is very thin. Accordingly, it may not be able to generate the enough pressure to uh, produce respective stop sounds or other sound. Now, what is the problem with reference to uh, the case of CLP speech? Because of this either cleft lip or palate or both, the generated nasal tract and oral tract gets connected and the velum may not close completely uh, to seal the nasal tract. As a result of this, the speech becomes more breathy, more nasalized. So as a result of that, it becomes unintelligible, unintelligible speech and there will be dental and occlusal deviations. And also it may lead to hearing and middle ear dysfunction. So eco-social development will be limited. Then also, as a result of that, the speech sound acquisition and language development, uh, that is because of this, we will have this what we call velo velopharyngeal dysfunction. Of course, what is the thing that is currently done to take care of this in speech and hearing institutes is, they will do primary surgery, followed by if enough no, the surgery has gone well, then they will under subjects will undergo speech therapy sessions or they can do secondary surgery and then further do some speech therapy. Now, one of the major issues in case of uh, uh, CLP speech is what we call velopharyngeal dysfunction, VPD. So what is that? It is the inability of the velum that is the hanging small tongue-like thing which is there, which we call it as velum, 
to adequately close the velopharyngeal gap. So accordingly, you know, there are three types of velopharyngeal dysfunction. The length of the velum can be small. That's why it will not be able to completely close the gap. That is velopharyngeal insufficiency or velopharyngeal incompetence because there is no stiffness in the velum well because of the neuromuscular dysfunction. <coughs> we may not be able to close it. Velopharyngeal mislearning because there is a cleft lip and palate, we might have started practicing using velum at different locations as a result of that. Uh, it may be closing at some other location than the correct location. So any one of these three cases may be a uh, cause for what we call this velopharyngeal dysfunction. So the children with velopharyngeal dysfunction may demonstrate one or more of the following. One is hypernasality. The speech is highly nasal or nasal air emission. They may be emitting a lot of air in the through the nasal tract or they may be doing compensatory articulation productions. Instead of producing one particular st stop sound, they may be generating the stop sound by keeping closing or occluding the vocal tract system at some other location. There can be nasal turbulence or it can be hyponasality. Because, so uh, among all of these things is the one of the important thing is what is called hypernasality and the work is focused on that. Just to illustrate the case of this one, this is the velum, soft velum, which is above is the nasal tract, bottom is the oral tract. Whenever I'm producing oral sounds, this velum should completely seal this trachea so that no air enters to the nasal cavity. And there is no cleft pill left or palate. The air completely goes through the oral cavity and then. So any of this dysfunction by the velum, um, it will lead to excess nasality during speech production. This is due to velopharyngeal insufficiency. Then oral nasal coupling will cause us, will cause nasalization of the vowels. So intelligent CLP speech reduces. Then essentially uh, the speech language pathologists will listen to such speech signals to decide whether to take a surgical intervention or they can do a, with some speech therapy. So that way they will listen, but after that they will. One of the discussion point was, can I have uh, automatic method for hypernasality detection? The thing what we, uh, because they have direct method by using instruments, nasoendoscopy like this, we wanted indirect methods by using acoustic measurements or the spectral analysis method we want to develop. If you see in the blue color, we have, see these are, Oval A, E, and U extracted from blue color shows for spectrum for normal sounds, normal speech, and red color shows the uh, spectrum for hypernasal speech. You can see that there will be more emphasis on the low frequency component because of the hypernasality present. Okay, so this is being exploited by the existing methods in the literature to come up with a method for hypernasality detection. So that is the existing literature. We wanted to see whether we can come up with an excitation source based method for uh, um, the detection of the hypernasal speech. So that is where uh, what we call a peak to side lobe ratio. We will do uh, LP linear prediction analysis, which is essentially when I consider the conventional LP analysis, Along with that, we'll also have some coefficients corresponding to uh, zeros also introduced by the hypernasality. As a result of that, uh, if I see, this is a segment of speech signal. This is for the normal speech. And the second column is for the hypernasal speech. You can see in the waveform, there is a difference in its nature. When we do the LP analysis <coughs> and extract the LP residual signal, you can see the structure of the LP residual signal is intact, whereas this is buried in noise because of hypernasality that we have. So this was the motivation for us to come up with a method for hypernasality rotation using excitation source information. For example, from the LP residual, if I compute Hilbert tunnel of the LP residual, there will be strong peaks around the glottal closure instance and such 
structure, nearly periodic structure will be buried in noise. These peaks are there, but they are not very prominent. So this behavior between the normal and the hypernasal speech um, motivated us to come up with a measure to say that no, as a humans, when when I see this, I say that this is no, this is more intact. Peakiness is available well, but the peakiness is missing here in this case. The same thing we defined as a, what is called peak to side lobe ratio, where you locate the epoch location and you take a small neighborhood around that. You find out the mean of the signal amplitude, excluding the peak amplitude. Peak amplitude divided by the mean of the signal values around that peak. That is mean, P by mu. That is called as peak to side lobe ratio. When you see this, uh, the peak to side lobe ratio values are relatively higher for a normal speech compared to the hypernasal speech. So that is where we were able to, if you see the box plots, peak to side lobe ratio for oval R, this normal case, the the peak value, peak to side lobe ratio value is high, whereas relatively lower for hypernasal speech. And the spread is also according. And similarly for E and the oval O. So what it indicates is, even using excitation source information, because LP residual I am using, and Hilbert envelope of the LP residual, even using excitation source information, I am able to uh, find a discrimination between normal and hypernasal speech. So with that, we try to use some other thing, what we call, there is another source feature which we have proposed earlier for some other vocal tract constriction part that we call vocal tract constriction feature, which is essentially if I have uh, the a, a speech signal segment uh, epoch to epoch speech, one glottal closure instrument to the other glottal closure, one cycle, glottal cycle of the speech waveform is taken and the corresponding which we call it as a smooth signal, which we call it as a zero frequency filtered signal, we will find the cosine match between those two. If it is hypernasal, so it is expected that this value will be higher because uh, both will be matching well, whereas if it is a normal speech, this ZFF is, is a much smoother signal. So accordingly, their, uh, the uh, correlation between them or similarity between them is less. Accordingly, the uh, par parameter value will go down. Another one is normalized first, uh, uh, no, normalized lower order capsule coefficient features were also used. So capsule features is vocal tract information, whereas poic to side lobe ratio and vocal tract constrictions are the excitation source information. So just to evaluate them, we had collected the data from 30 normal subjects or children and 30 repaired uh, cleft palate children. Okay. So in this, according to the uh, speech language pathologies, 15 cases were there had mild, mild hypernasality, 10 had moderate hypernasality and 5 had severe hypernasality. So the age range of the children was 7 to 12, and they were native speakers of Kannada, which is the official language of Karnataka state. And the stimuli we used was, we were, ask, we, we were asking them to produce a speech for three words, papa, pp, popo. Essentially, a, e, u, we want to collect, but intermixed with stop consent so that these three are uh, valid words in Kannada language, it is easy for the children to produce. So both for normal and uh, uh, repaired CP children, we collected data. Then we exercised the vowels, I, U, and then see uh, uh, using those features, can we do the classification? For example, uh, these, the different nature, number of normal and hypernasal stimuli recorded are 300. So normal were 271 and Calculate, you no, know, hypernasals were 232 as decided by three uh, speech language pathologists. They marked them. Then the phoneme extracted, again, SLP is marked 542 as normal and hypernasal as 4. These are taken as the ground truth data, gold standard data for hypernasality detection. Now, this is the performance of uh, the hypernasal detection method. If I use only vocal tract constriction feature alone, uh, the performance has something 
accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. Let us for, just focus on accuracy, any one of these things. If I take accuracy, you get about 70%. Uh, whereas capsule features, some sort of focal track features, existing one already gives 80%. Whereas uh, accordingly, is focal track constriction or peak to side lobe ratio, which are ex mainly excitation source information, even though they are relatively poor, however, they are from a different dimension of speech production. That is, they are representing excitation source information. So accordingly, we combined all the three when the combination shows an improved medicine over the individual systems. This is for oval E. And the same trend was observed for the other ovals also. And even oval level accuracy also, the same trend was observed. So what it indicates is, uh, even though the performance of uh, uh, hypernasality detection using excitation source information alone is relatively uh, inferior compared to vocal track system features represented by capsule features, uh, they combine well to produce a combined result which is better than the individual systems. This shows the potential of excitation source information for um, the hypernasality detection. Next one is, we wanted to see the potential of the same features, the combination features to further, when detected as hypernasality, how well that hypernasality can further segregate normal, mild, and moderate to severe. Moderate, severe, there are not many examples, that's why we have put them into one class. So if you see this, the confusion matrix also is given here. So accuracy was 80.13, if you see the previous case, somewhere 80.13. So uh, the um, severity accuracy, this normal case, 90% are collected, you know, classified as normal. And whereas mild, because of most similarity with reference to the normal, most confusion happens with reference to the normal. Whereas moderate to severe, the performance is definitely better than mild, but some confusion will be there with the other cases also. The same trend was observed. Also. So uh, this essentially shows the significance of excitation source information um, for hypernasality detection and also severity assessment. So this has been published in Journal of Acoustical Society of America in 2009, entitled Detection and Assessment of Hypernasality in Repaired Cleft Palate Speech Using Vocal Tract and Residual Features. We wanted to, once we got this uh, interesting trend, we wanted to see, can I have um, an uh, hyper automatic assessment of hypernasality? So for that purpose, what we did was, when we got this training data, oval region selection and feature extraction, which is all the three features which I mentioned earlier, we developed that regression function for normal and hypernasal cases. Then during testing, again, you do the same process and then you know, map with the regression function to find out the nasality score in the range from zero to one. So this is what is the uh, system that we developed. For example, I can load either oval A, E, or U. The waveform is displayed. Then you can compute hypernasality. It will give me the computed hypernasality score. And this is given from 0 to 1, which shows the color code was given by Aish team that if it is you know, higher the value, more will be the hypernasality. And the red mark indicates that it requires. Uh, no, uh, more attention because whereas in the lower the values that shows that it's more closer towards the normal speech. The next, this is about the hypernasality detection, uh, evaluation, performance evaluation of the potential features and also developing a hypernasality assessment system for clinical application. That is one contribution. Well, the point which I wanted to emphasize was there we used a peak to side lobe ratio and vocal tract constriction both exploit excitation source information. Using that, the whole effort was. Next one is hypernasal oval enhancement. Suppose once I have the extracted ovals, if they are hypernasals, can I uh, enhance them artificially 
to reduce the hypernasality. Okay, so uh, essentially, because even after the surgery, because of the missed learning, uh, still until the therapy is done, this hypernasality will be there. Fifty percent after even fifty percent after uh, surgery, poor speech quality. Enter. So what we have to do is. Uh, suppose a person produces hypernasal speech and this is possible through this system and you enhance the speech by speech enhancement method that is hypernasality enhancement method if uh, the enhanced speech shows a, a better perception the subjects will get motivated by themselves that no okay uh, if i try to modulate then I may be able to reach the target of getting an enhanced speech. Just to give them as a feedback, we wanted to develop a method for hypernasal oval enhancement. Two things for we found out, uh, we have used weighted linear prediction here. Essentially, two weighted coefficients are used, which was found to be uh, better in terms of compared to the normal LP analysis. And we wanted to, using now, modify using temporal processing and spectral processing. Temporal processing was essentially weighting the linear prediction residue, which is nothing but weighting the, modifying the excitation source information. Then the spectral deviation is in terms of finding the vocal tract features and trying to find a mapping function between hypernasal oval features versus the normal feature. That mapping function is taken and weighted LP residual is taken and combine them to generate the oval enhanced speech. So that is what we have done. Of course, we had data collected from Aish Maisu, native Canada speakers. We had 15 normal and 15 hypernasal speakers. Uh, so uh, if you see this, um, the, the block dot shows linear normal linear prediction and blue curve shows extended linear prediction which is which shows more prominence for the spectral peaks and also the bandwidth is narrow and this is the FFT spectrum so that is the advantage of so you have a, a more pronounced peaks in the extended linear prediction so accordingly a better prediction of the coefficient hence the residual will be more representative of the excitation source information for example we have normal speech and the LP residual um and the this is for oval e and this is the hypernasal speech and the corresponding uh, lp residual but extended lp residual that we have considered if you see for example if i go for a normal speech and oval e phonation if i consider there will be lot of difference or spectral gap between the first format and the second form first format anywhere from 200 to 300 hertz and the second formant goes beyond 2000 hertz. Whereas because of the hypernasality, you can see, you don't find much gap between the first and the, uh, the second formant. That is where it sounds more like nasal. And the whole purpose is, how do I enhance the gap that is present here? Okay. So for that purpose, we, will, we found out this voice low tone to high tone ratio that we have um, found out. Uh, then if you see this normal case that voice low tone to high tone ratio is lower whereas it is higher in the case of different vowels so this is one of the motivating factors for uh, you know, which is proposed here voice low tone to high tone ratio in interpret transaction biotic to that feature we use it just to understand that this uh, low tone to high tone ratio indeed uh, helps us to differentiate between different words. But the proposed method, what we have done is do the, the source speech, which is essentially hypernasal speech, do the extended linear prediction analysis. You get the linear prediction capsule coefficients. Similarly, you have the target speech, which is a normal speech. Do the similar uh, extended linear prediction analysis. Get the normal speech, extended linear prediction capsule coefficient. Then a GMM based mapping function you find out between the extended and the normal case and that mapping function is used here. Then uh, for the temporal processing, you take the input speech frame, do the extended linear prediction, do the inverse filtering to get the residual. Once I have the residual, uh, you do the fine weighting function of the residual, essentially to emphasize small regions around the glottal closure instant. And 
you have the extended linear prediction uh, input speech, which is hypernasal speech, and that gets mapped to uh, normal speech. And then you do the um, uh, speech synthesis using or synthesis using extended linear prediction synthesis filter. You get the transformed speech frame. So that is how the enhancement of the ovals, hypernasal ovals were carried out. So, um, of course, I am unable to play these files. Let me. So, these are the normal speech condition A and B. These are normal, this is normal speech and the corresponding residual. Whereas, hypernasal speech and the corresponding residual. If you see this by the modified hypernasal, when I take, I am emphasizing the LP residual, which is more closer to the uh, to normal response. That gives us a slightly better perception of the uh, speech signal. So the same thing was uh, this one. For example, when I when I do that enhancement, you can see I, I start seeing some gap between the first and second format. Okay, so that is where, for example, the performance uh, measured in terms of uh, STOI and ESTOI are given here. Uh, for example, if normal reference, if you consider this is the reference, whereas uh, original thing for R, original signal was giving this much score and uh, temporal modi modified was like this vocal tract system modified that is using the gmm function is this definitely vocal tract system case is significantly better in this case and the combined thing what is important is temporal processing and vocal tract system when i combine the combined system provides a relatively good performance same trend was observed for the our other vowels also even in terms of other measures also so what is important is if I take this excitation source information, the performance is relatively poor compared to vocal track. However, since that information is different, I am able to combine them to get an improved performance. That is what is consistently demonstrated in all the cases. And the same thing of capsule distortion also, if you see. So, if I um, take the combined method is this one. Okay. So, which is, let me see. The M1 denotes a spectral capsule distance value between normal and unmodified hypernasal. The capsule distance is I. M2 denotes between normal and hypernasal wall after uh, residual modification. And M3 for vocal tract system modification. And M4 for uh, between target and the hypernasal wall after both residual and vocal tract. Model. You can see that when I combine both modification, the spectral the capsule distortion is minimum. Same thing is observed for the other oval cases also. Even the classification results also, if I see original ovals, if I consider and do the classification, a binary classifier of hypernasal versus normal, most of them were classified as uh, hypernasal, 76% and remaining as normal. Whereas if I modify by using the proposed method, so majority of them were classified as normal. So that means to say the proposed algorithm is effective um, in enhancing the ovals present in the hypernasal case. If I take only the GMM case, uh, the performance significance is not uh, that great. So accordingly, which shows the effectiveness of combining the excitation source information also for this enhancement case. So that is the this one even mean opinion score when I consider uh, which has you know, um, uh, the combination of uh, the temporal modification of vocal tract system modification gives me the uh, least mean opinion score with reference to um, hypernasal case. It has to come minimum for hypernasal. So that is what and even the uh, if you go for orthographic transcription of the decoded uh, uh, listened speech, the combination gives me that 81% compared to individual cases. So that is what I observe. So this is about the second contribution that we have done. Now I will go to the third contribution where uh, oval onset point detection, that is one of the uh, basic uh, signal processing algorithm that we develop especially tune that oval onset point direction algorithm so that it becomes suitable for cleft lip and pellet speech. Once I have that oval onset point, I can use it as an anchor point and try to use that for misarticulated stop detection. So that is the purpose. Now the whole framework for that uh, 
processing was like this. Suppose I get the incoming speed signal. I do what we call single pole filtering um, and uh, epoch extraction, extract the excitation source information and use that knowledge for oval onset point detection. Once I detect the oval onset point, use them as anchor point to extract what we call spectrotemporal features. Once I have the spectral temporal features, I can use it for normal versus misarticulated stop constants. Further, I can also use that knowledge for glottal versus non-glottal sound classification. The other direction was uh, analysis of nasalized voice stops. We followed what is called knowledge-based segmentation, where essentially we use uh, acoustic phonetic knowledge for doing. Epoch synchronous features were extracted, means glottal total instant uh, synchronized features are extracted and used for normal versus nasalized stop and nasalized versus non nasalized stop. So, all these individual methods normal versus misarticulated, glottal versus non glottal, nasalized versus non nasalized, all of them are combined to come up with a visual display, what we call spider plot, which speech language pathologists can see to see what is the top consonant articulation index the, uh, that is there. Also, the, we can use it for multi-class classification. For whatever the missa, whether the given stop sound is misarticulated, if it is misarticulated, whether it is misarticulated as a glottal or non-glottal or nasalized uh, or non-nasalized. So that is what we have uh, done and that is what they required itself. Well. For example, in the data that we collected, suppose if I take a stop sound ka, uh, the speech language pathologists have marked them in the collected data. 192, they marked it as weakly articulated ka, then uh, nasalized sound as 18, and pharyngeal sound as 64, and glottal sounds as 312, which is supposed to be velar ka, but most of them are confused as glottal sounds. Same way for other uh, stop sound also it goes. Um, for example, now what we have done is, if I consider a small segment of uh, CV segment, uh, I will have this oval onset point, which is the instant at which the onset of oval takes place. Before that, we'll have the burst region and there is a silence region. Okay. So, the uh, if I consider for the, uh, this is for, for sound ta and it's a spectrogram, the first case, and this C and E represent syllables uh, containing glottal and nasalized sound. These are the glottal and these are the nasalized sound. You can see the nasalized sound since that voice bar is there, detection of the oval onset point. And oval onset point detection becomes difficult in the case of glottal sounds because of the other uh, uh, burst-like things which are occurring before the occurrence of oval onset. So, in the, compared to the normal case, there are challenges in the misarticulated stops and how do I come up with first oval? Once I have a method, proper detection of oval onset point, then I can take a small spectrotemporal region around this, essentially analyzing the spectrogram around this, extract the features from that and use it for uh, um, classification stops. So that is what we have done. Of course, the oval onset point detection, we had earlier proposed methods for oval onset points in case of normal uh, speech. For example, one publication came in 2009, oval onset point detection using source spectral peaks and modulation spectrum energies. And uh, uh, then we also had a publication on speaker verification by oval and non-oval like segments. But when we saw them directly used for um, um, case of cleft clip and pele, for example, the ground truth is shown by these black arrows, whereas the detected VOP comes at red arrows, which is deviated from the actual location of the oval onset point. So that is where, by observation and analysis, we came up with the proposed approach, which first thing is syllable nucleus detection. And we have come up with a feature, what is called maximum weighted inner product, derived using this epoch-based process. When I say epoch-based processing, the epochs are nothing but the excitation source information sequence. I can use that knowledge. And we don't do smoothing what we were doing in the case of uh, earlier existing. When I do smoothing, already the, the resolution of the VOP detection is compromised. So that is where the advantage of the proposed method came. And this is some ex no extended plots for that. And this is how 
this weighted maximum weighted linear product that is there between <laughs> this one. For example, <coughs> if I take this blue curve shows the maximum weighted inner product. If I, and I consider the signal components from 50 to 500 hertz, and this is from 500 to 4000 hertz. Now, if you see, uh, if you consider 500 to 4000 hertz, this red curve shows a proper marking discrimination between the oval onset point compared both in the case of nasal case also and the other non-nasal case also. So that is where we used that uh, uh, category. For example, this curve shows maximum weighted inner product, that green curve-like thing. So this essentially starts showing discrimination starting from oval onset point. So that is where, and this is the algorithm. So 500 to 4000 hertz range, if I consider, and I consider the maximum weighted inner product. And then if I consider 10, 10 millisecond as the resolution around the ground truth, about 95% are detected properly. Whereas if I consider 40 millisecond as the range, I get 99%. But what is important is a misarticulated case. So that the proposed method gives, you know, better performance compared to this one. We have comparison here. Earlier methods are there and the last one is the proposed method. We can see the performance of that is better compared to the existing. So in that way, uh, again, here also the maximum weighted inner product is also based on the excitation source information. And this is the uh, range over which the, the performance will be changing for different deviations. And once we had that Oval onset point, you consider a small region around that and to get what we call two dimensional discrete time cosine transform coefficient, two, two dimension DC. You can see that pictorially, if I locate this oval onset point here, the dynamics are different, spectrotemporal dynamics are different around that oval onset point for different types of stops. So, accordingly, I can extract these spectrotemporal patterns and try and a support support vector machine, a binary classifier for different uh, SVMs. For example, for CA itself, I have a separate SVM where I have the proper spectrotemporal regions for CA versus the misarticulated cases. All of them are used as negative examples and trying this one. So then during testing, when I get the VOP detection, a segment around the 2D DCT features, and those are compared with the SVM one by one and to whichever it matches best, I will do the classification accordingly. Now you can see the um, the performance of uh, detection of misarticulated and normal and combined accuracy if you consider. The proposed method uh, is able to perform better compared to the other existing methods, VOP detection. Essentially, um, when I say this, this method is better, uh, the accurate location of oval onset point is important. Once I locate that, I will be picking a spectrotemporal region around the oval onset point, which is accurately representing the discriminatory information for different cases of stop sounds. That is the reason why the performance of this proposal method will be better compared. To that. So that is the same way, this 2D dimen two dimensional DCT, we can extract by different methods one method, what we have is what we call single pole uh, filtering. And the other one is conventional short term Fourier transform. The third one is the conventional MFCC. You can see that using the, the two dimensional DCT, the performance is better compared to MFCC, which essentially appreciated also because I'm looking into a matrix of features around the whole onset point. A two dimensional information is exploited. Further, I have if I go by single pole filtering, the resolution is better. So as a result of that, I'm able to get further discrimination, better performance. So similarly, once I have that oval onset point detection, I can also do glottal versus non-glottal classifying. We had uh, 14 children who had um, weak velar or parietal misarticulation, and uh, which is if a total, if we consider 690 were glottal and another non-glottal, but normal subject all are non-glottal, okay? Whereas 
for those pathological cases, majority of them were substituted by the glottal. So given a star zone, can I classify it as a glottal or non-glottal? Again, we exploited the 2D DCT extracted using the oval onset point and the uh, things are shown here. Definitely the glottal sounds are detected properly when I go for uh, two-dimensional DCT using single pole filtering uh, compared to the other cases. And uh, non-glottal also the same trend is observed and the combined. Okay. Even the manual and automatic, if I see, uh, the trends are following the same way. Of course, automatic is relatively slightly poorer, but however, the trend remains the same. So this is about this. Similarly, for the nasalized uh, stop detection, that is also another case, uh, which is another parallel channel through which we went. Suppose if I go for nasalized sound, so we have this spectral temporal regions show a distinction between non-nasalized versus nasalized case. Okay, so uh, these are the cases, different uh, number of tokens that we consider normalized, weak, nasalized, <coughs> glottal, and different cases were considered. Now, essentially, when I see the spectrotemporal regions and also uh, in the spectrogram and the waveform condition, if I this red location shows the oval onset point detection, I take this block region to be CV transition region, okay, and this this uh, uh, this light yellow color thing is uh, articulately closure region. So I can exploit uh, these three cases: I, oval onset point detection using excitation source, then we have CV transition detection, and then the articulately closure. So all this information are exploited and features are extracted, both spectral and excitation source feature, and then fed into SVM classifier, which gives us normal versus nasalized voice of stop uh, detection. Okay. So this is this waveform shows how to uh, find out the difference between glottal activity and non glottal activity and some modification for that algorithm. And this is some finer details. And now you can see uh, the performance of the segmentation algorithm. Normal voice at stop, if I consider, uh, I have the proposed method and HMM method are almost the same. Okay. Both uh, PA, PC in correct detection rate, PF is false detection. But what is important is the timing error is significantly lower in the proposed method compared to the HMM method. So that was the advantage that we had shown. Okay. So, and by different features, we exploited and shown the performance and this fusion is done for different DCT, DCT, Hilbert envelope and subband 2D DCT, different explorations are there. <coughs> but the take home message is, um, we are indeed able to exploit the sole onset point detection method using excitation source information to extract discriminatory features and do uh, nasal versus non-nasal classification. So then we wanted to exploit that to a, a visual display. So this is what a visual display spider plot was generated. Mm -hmm. There are eight uh, stop constant considered. And this is the outer circle where complete uh, misarticulation is there. And 0.5 is um, this uh, octagon that is there here, which shows the threshold. If the articulation disorder values are within this uh, 0.5, they are you no know, proper. But if it goes beyond that, that misarticulation for that case increases. For example, if I consider the first case, uh, the articulation error is about 8.25%, which shows you no know, within the uh, tolerance octagon of 0.5. Whereas if I go for the second figure, one of the chi is misarticulation of chi is exceeding the normal threshold that we consider. And this further increases for different cases and uh, fully misarticulated 56.5%, which is shown here, which is almost all stop components are misarticulated. And the same way, stop articulation index are also uh, represented as the number of misarticulated stop increases the stop card articulation index also increases. That is also another measure. Uh, 
for 30 normal and 30 CLP children we consider. Uh, X, of, X axis will represent the number of misarticulate stop and Y axis represent the top constant articulation index. Okay. And the other one was they wanted a three class classification system. You have the stop constant given as to uh, SVM. We first level binary classifier is there. Which will classify whether it is in this normal produced stop or misarticulated stop. So that is the binary. Once I take the mis misarticulated case, again it goes to another SVM where glottal and non glottal stop is there. For example, one of the three class classifiers they needed was whether it is normal or misarticulated. If it is misarticulated, whether it is glottal or non glottal. So that is what their classification wanted. That is what the classifier built. And this is the performance by the proposed features and methods. Okay. Uh, similarly, they wanted further finer uh, this one, where normal versus misarticulated. And uh, again, misarticulated if you take whether glottal activity is present or glottal activity is absent. If glottal activity is absent, then again a binary classifier, whether it is glottal or non-glottal stop. Or if glottal activity is present, I have nasalized versus uh, um, non-nasalized conditions. So in that way, we are able to do the five class classification and the performance is also shown here. So uh, just to you know, I will stop here just to mention that we have explored certain uh, new directions where we used the knowledge of excitation source information uh, to address or develop new methods for uh, some of the uh, cases of um, pathological speech, especially CLP speech case, uh, to first case for detection of hypernasality. Second case was enhancement of um, uh, ovals in the case of hypernasal condition. The third one is the detection of oval onset point and using for coming up with methods for uh, detecting misarticulated stops in the hypernasal speech. Maybe I'll stop here and uh, no, thank you for your uh, patient listening. If you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer. Marcelo, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Prasanna, for your talk. Now we will move to the questions. Uh, in the audience, yes, and also uh, for those of you at YouTube, you can ask the questions on the chat. Yeah, for the question, please come here. Thank you, Professor Prasanna. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, very very nice. interesting your talk. You give a really a brief overview of I think your work during your, your last five, six years, you, you told us. Yes, yes. So, yes, yes. and the question I have, because this type of pathology is really, is related to the palate that is a resonator for the phonator system. And uh, it's not directly related to uh, the citatory source, I think. Hmm. So correct, correct. I think the, the results are really impressive because you use information that is not directly related with the pathology. Is that correct? correct. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Correct, correct. And it's not directly yes. related to pathology, but the excitation source information, when it passes through the uh, you know, problematic vocal tract system, its components also get deviated from the normal case that is being exploited uh, to come up with methods like this and which was your motivation to to look in in this type of, of excitation source signal ah see one of the things was of course earlier in the normal speech case we were using the excitation source information for for example earlier we exploited for speaker recognition even we exploited to some extent for some of the speech analysis case then since we were have that exposure for a longer time uh, to come up with you know majority of the community are working in the vocal tract system condition suppose if 
we are able to explore and see if there is any uh, possibility using excitation source information, then it can add value. From that perspective only we went. Not from you know, speech pathology advocates using uh, speech in source information. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rufino. More questions from the audience? Hi, uh, thank you, Professor Persona, for this thank great you, presentation. And thank my you. question is about the clinical application of your methods. This oh. is to be great to detect the different situations, the different cases. How do you have the opportunity to see, for example, how a, the clinical treatment or a surgery change this hypernasality ratio or the, the, the final output of your classification system? For example, if the phonation is improved, for a given surgery, a surgery procedure or for a given um, treatment, phenological treatment, uh, have you had this improvement in your, in your numbers, in your methods, in your the output of your systems? Oh, thank you very much for this question. See, what we had was the, uh, we did not further classify the subjects, uh, you know, before surgery and after surgery or something. But what uh, we got to know from our collaborators from Aish Mysore is they have done one level of surgery. And after one level of surgery, we, they have collected the data from that subject. Okay. But we did not collect the data for that subject before surgery. And we have not done the temporal tracking before surgery, what happens and after surgery. That part we have not done. What they wanted was they wanted a, an automatic method where it will help the speech language pathologies instead of uh, listening to the speech signal and making some decision whether we can provide some improvement from that perspective this is a very interesting thing we have not done in that direction um, and another question you have paid a lot of attention to the the source of excitations mm. and also combine this information with the vocal tracts information the, the spectral information have Correct. you considered how uh, about the cognitive or neural procedure that are uh, be, uh, that, that command all these the source excitation and vocal tract? For example, the the cognitive response to different situations. If this uh, normal, sorry, this neuronal function or how the neural function also influence have uh, have an influence in these uh, in this uh, pathological cases? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's again another wonderful question. But uh, our focus is mainly on the production point of view. We have not, you know, looked from that neurocognition point of view. Maybe it's an interesting thing if somebody wants to look into. We don't have the data collected in that direction. Thank so, you very much for your answer. Thank you. Thank you. More questions from the audience? Okay, yes, Matthias. Hello, Professor Prasanna. Hi. I, I have a question regarding, uh, it's a bit different. It's regarding the, the loading, acoustic loading effect of the hyper nasality case um, in the voice source parameters. So thinking uh, in the work of uh, Ingo Tietze, for instance, where there's there's a lot of interest on how the vocal tract changes the source uh, behavior. Um, so fr from your work, uh, what is your uh, take on that? What, what is the the core effect of, of this scenario, hyper nasality? On, on how actually the vocal folds are, are performing. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. See, uh, definitely, you know, uh, there will be effect of, since the supraglottal structure is not normal, to that extent, to make uh, the speech more intelligible, 
the subject tries to emphasize the speech to that extent there will be load on the uh, uh, excitation source okay so that may for example if i see r e u the different vowels the the uh, source parameter discrimination is different that indirectly indicates the loading effect that may be there in different cases but we have not done any structured study in that case even in normal speech analysis also we had this thought process that there will be loading effect of the supraglottal structure onto the excitation source but we have not done any study which a systematic study to analyze the amount of this loading that happens but it's an interesting thing to look into right right thank you um so so the loading it, it's a complicated, I, I see, it's a complicated point because Correct. You, you were referring to the compensation, right? Because you, if you're leaking yes. air, then you're compensating. Yes. So, so that's yes. a secondary compensatory effect. Um, I, I see your point that it's hard to separate the loading yes. it on its own. Okay, thank you so yes. much. Thank you, Ernest. thank you. Any other question? No? So we, we do not have any questions from the virtual audience. So I think this is the end of the first talk. Thank you Thank again you. very much, Professor Prasanna. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Marcelo, for all the coordination. Thank you, Gasco. Thank you, Rufina. Thank you. Thank you. All the best for the workshop. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You. We will be resuming after 2 p.m. Yes. Uh, OK. You. And we hope to, to see you also uh, connecting via YouTube. Luego de las 2 de la tarde, entonces estamos retomando con las charlas. Gracias.